Hi, my name is Nate Bloom. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Sorghum United. Sorghum United is an international NGO, and what we really focus on is we focus on trying to find regional food system solutions to hunger, malnutrition, and environmental and economic sustainability. And we do this uh, within the context of sorghum and other small millets, small grains, uh, that we find are highly nutritive through research that's been published around the world. So they're great in human diets, and they can also be used for fuel and fiber applications as well. And from an environmental standpoint, uh, they're excellent uh, for soil health, water conservation, carbon sequestration, and biodiversity, uh, in, in that pollinators love those habitats, as do birds. So what we really do is we connect people all along the points of the value chain within sorghum and millets, and we try to uh, provide them with the tools that can empower them uh, to assess the situations and the concerns on the ground, and then help help them to come up with solutions that make sense within those regional populations, really around uh, solutions similar to providing more value to farmers through uh, placing processing, which is proximate to the production of grain which we feel can increase the profits for farmers, decrease supply lines, uh, create entrepreneurial opportunities and jobs, while at the same time uh, providing uh, increased and improved health outcomes within communities through uh, these, these uh, food products using these grains. Well, listen, we say there's room on the plate for everybody, okay? So we like maize, we like wheat, we like rice, we like soy, we like all of these grains. But what happens is uh, sorghum and millets are very overlooked. Uh, they're, uh, we have a global system, global systems, I should say, uh, which uh, disadvantage these small grains, which have largely been forgotten. I call them forgotten heritage grains, actually. Um, and so nobody's doing the advocacy for these grains on the global scale. Uh, outside of the United Nations and the great work they've done at the FAO. Uh, there's great work being done in places like India and parts of Africa, and we're really, uh, we really uh, are very um, uh, thankful for the work that those governments and those organizations have done. But outside of those areas, the uh, message of the International Year of Millets uh, largely hasn't gained a ton of traction, though we are seeing some growth. And so our organization's job is to really take that message and make uh, ourselves advocates uh, for these cranes, which sorely need advocates in places around the world. Well, I grew up on the farm in Nebraska. I'm a fourth generation farmer. Now, on, a, on our farm, we raised sorghum, or as we call it in North America, Milo. Uh, here in uh, Kenya, by the way, I understand the, the name is Matana. Uh, you know, so everywhere you go, it's called something just a little bit different. But I grew up growing these grains, um, but I didn't know very much about them. Until, oh, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago, I was serving as the uh, Director of Agricultural Policy for uh, a member of the United States Congress uh, and started doing more work directly again with farmers policy level, which is when I really became aware of these cranes. And then a few years uh, later, after that role, uh, there was an opportunity to work as the executive director for the Nebraska Grain Sorghum Board, which is a state organization working specifically for sorghum farmers. And as I learned more about the nutritive value, the environmental benefits, and really how we can provide uh, opportunities for diversification within cropping systems and economic uh, opportunities through mitigation of value-added, local value-added systems, which can complement uh, the existing commodity marketing system. Um, I saw that there are some real opportunities to find some solutions to some of the biggest problems that we're facing around the world, um, and, and it's couched in sorghum and millets. So my personal experience is the more I've learned about these grains, uh, the more excited I get. I don't think they're a silver bullet. I don't think they're the only solution, uh, but I certainly think that they are a part of a solution within larger complex systems, both in uh, regional food security as well as uh, diversification on the farm. Well, the, the challenges for sorghum and millets internationally uh, are the same wherever you go. Actually, that's how Sorghum United got started, uh, was I attended a conference in uh, Mont er, in Montpellier. For, no, sorry, I'm sorry, it was in Toulouse, France. I attended a conference in Toulouse, France, and I listened to my counterparts from Europe talk about their challenges, and I said, my gosh, we've got the same problems. The global industry is not that large. And so through that, we came together and decided to start finding some ways to work together, even though we might be competitors in other areas. And so really the most common problem for our sorghum uh, farmers and millets farmers is uh, that of markets access, right? 
So right now, 80% of the world's supply of grain sorghum, for example, is purchased by China. 93% of U.S. sorghum is purchased by China. Okay, that leaves very. It's fantastic. We love when they're buying it, but it also means that typically prices can be somewhat controlled uh, at those volumes. Um, and, and meanwhile, we have uh, a very nascent, I would say, is a good way to describe the the processing community and infrastructure for sorghum and millets. Most of our processors, and we have dozens of processors uh, within our network all over the globe, but most of them are small scale. You know, and even at the governmental level, when you're uh, talking about governments working with small business incubators and things like this, the work is being done, but it's small scale. It needs to be scaled up. Mechanization needs to be developed. Um, this is really the biggest challenge. So one is, uh, you know, great. If we grow a bunch of grain, where are we going to sell it at, uh, for a value? And two, if we do grow a bunch of grain and we can sell it at value, uh, how are we going to process it efficiently so that we can, you know, look at it in the same types of volumes that we see other grains? Uh, those are really the biggest challenges. Uh, there obviously are policy uh, recommendations that we make when we speak with policymakers, uh, whether they're in in uh, in Asia or Africa or America or, uh, or Europe. Um, but really what it comes down to uh, is uh, markets. Uh, I'm a farm kid, and I can tell you farmers will grow a crop if it's marketable, if they can make a profit doing so. It's wonderful to provide them incentives for sustainability uh, and climate smart crops. That's fantastic. But what they really need are markets. Love me a, I love a good sorghum beer. Uh, sorghum whiskey is fantastic. Also, if you get a chance to have sorghum whiskey, that's fine. And actually, the most widely drank spirit in the entire world is something called Baiju, B-A-I-J-I-U. And that's what the Chinese make with sorghum. It's a cultural touchstone in China. When you go to China, any, any official dinner you're having, you're getting shots of Baiju all night long, whether you want it or not. Uh, so that market, the distillation market, the uh, fermentation market, those are fantastic. But they're not the only markets. So from a food standpoint, like in my house, uh, we use sorghum and other millets just the same as we would rice. Not that we've completely replaced rice. We eat rice too. Okay, nothing wrong with that. But maybe one meal a week, instead of using rice, we'll use a sorghum or a millet as a pilaf or, or in some other way. We'll use them in a, in a soup, for example. Or as a flour, it's a gluten-free, uh, non-GMO flour, right? So with you, if you mix it in potato starch or you buy an all-purpose sort of flour that already has these things mixed in, and some xanthan gum, which then serves as the binder to, to replace gluten, um, we use it just like you would for any regular wheat recipe. There's no special recipe to it. Um, you know, so, so that's how we use it there at home in the food space, and that's some of the value-added things. Now, as far as markets development go, uh, globally, uh, snack foods for humans uh, is a very large and fast-growing market, whether it's pop sorghum, roasted sorghum, sorghum in uh, some sort of a granola-type bar or a cookie or whatever it might be. Those are becoming very, very popular. Um, in the pet food market, that's actually the fastest-growing market in the United States is the pet food market for sorghum in particular. Um, and then, of course, ethanol. We can make ethanol from sorghum just as efficiently as we can corn. You don't get as much of the oil byproduct. Uh, but uh, from an efficiency standpoint, the yields are, are very, very similar. Um, and then from a, uh, from a fiber standpoint, especially if you're looking at forage sorghum, which are the very tall varieties of sorghum with a small head versus a grain sorghum, which is a shorter variety with a large head, uh, you know, the stocks can be used to extract sugars. So you can use it just like you would sugar cane. But from a fiber standpoint, uh, you can use it also to make things like temporary building materials. Or uh, you can make clothing out of it. Or any, any other thing you would make from a fibrous plant, right? There's even a company where I live in Nebraska. They're a startup company called Pro Materials. And they've uh, patented a process to make carbon fiber, renewable carbon fiber, out of grain sorghum. The wonderful thing about it, not only is it renewable and sustainable... But it costs them something like $2.30 U.S. to make a pound of carbon fiber out of grain sorghum. If they were to make that same pound of carbon fiber out of petroleum products, traditionally how it's done, it's something like $5.30 a pound. So as they scale up, imagine what that does for uh, the costs of your vehicles. Anything that has carbon fiber, right? Cost your vehicles, your bicycles, your cell phone, your laptop. All of these uh, things that we take for granted that use carbon fiber, that uh, we can decrease drastically in a sustainable way one of the key input costs. So it's a very versatile grain. It can do quite a, quite a lot of different things, uh, just like any other grain yet, quite frankly. Sorghum and other millets in food systems here in Africa in particular. 
The reality is uh, that these grains were originally grown. They, they, they were cultivated first in places like Africa and Mesopotamia and, and Asia, okay? And we've just largely been forgotten. Um, you know, meanwhile, we have uh, developed an over-dependence on other grains. Again, not that there's anything wrong with other grains, your wheats of the world, your maize of the world, etc. Um, but we've th these, these crops are not as good, as well-suited, I should say, uh, to dry, arid climates, uh, climates where rainfall might be variable. Now, one thing uh, that I think we can all agree on is there have been significant challenges within global food supply chains in the last four to five years, uh, not the least of which was COVID-19 and then the conflict in Ukraine between Ukraine and Russia. It is unfortunate, in my opinion, that we have people in parts of the world uh, that are starving as a result of the disruptions of global wheat supply chain uh, failures, when at the same time, they could be growing these grains in a sustainable way within their own environments for regional food security. This is one of the things that we feel uh, in order to empower populations to grow uh, and to thrive, uh, we need to be thinking about uh, food independence, okay? Because really, true independence or a community, an individual, or a nation begins with food independence. Um, there's always a, a place for international trade, obviously, so it's neither, it's never this or that. Um, but uh, there, there definitely is a need to reimagine how we do regional food security uh, for the sake of our populations around the world. Listen, I think the opportunities and potential for sorghum and millets in the next five to ten years are going to be unrecognizable to where we could even imagine today. And I don't say that just as an optimist. I say that because I've been working within the policy and agriculture industry for the last uh, 15 years or more, and I grew up on the farm. And I can tell you just anecdotally how many more products and how many more uh, news articles and how many more bloggers, and how many more chefs just in the last few years have started to utilize sorghum and millets, promote sorghum and millets, uh, talk about the health benefits of sorghum and millets. Just the other day, one of the largest uh, celebrity chefs, most popular celebrity chefs in the United States, uh, a woman named Ree Drummond, or the Pioneer Woman, uh, her blog actually had an article specifically on sorghum. That's a big deal. It doesn't seem like much, right? It's a blog post on somebody's website, but it's a big deal because that gets to a whole brand new audience, right? And so we're already seeing whether it's more pet foods. Gerber in the U.S. now has a line of baby food using, using sorghum. Uh, Cheerios, uh, kind bars, all sorts of other products uh, are using sorghum and millets within their formulations. And that's the important key when you're looking at markets as an entrepreneur, by the way, is you're, they're, they're not creating new products and hoping that consumers adopt them, right? They're tweaking formulations for existing products. And then adding the value, saying this is sustainable, this is healthy, this is non-GMO, in which you can capture more value also from consumers. You know, so this is an important distinction to make. Uh, so where do I see it going? You know, it's uh, it, it's been like uh, it's been like a snowball rolling downhill. When I started, you know, this industry seemed like it was very very small and solely catered to the export market. But over the years, I've seen this snowball grow and grow and grow. And every year that we continue to see success, the bigger that ball gets.